And so this is a strategy from agroecology, cover cropping. And the idea, again, is to work with nature, not against it. Um, so the agro refers to ag agriculture, ecology, ecological systems. And it's all about using ecological principles, how things work in nature, and then applying that towards agriculture, towards farming systems. And agroecology, it's not any one system like um, organic or intensive or extensive. It's, it's different techniques that are sort of based in nature. Um, some examples of what I'm talking about of agroecology. Crop rotations. Um, so you incorporate temporal diversity into the different plants you're planting each season. Um, you rotate the crops. This adds different nutrients into the soil and it also breaks up cycles of pests and diseases that have an easy time sticking around if you're always planting the exact same species in the same spot year round. Um, so you rotate, plant some corn and then plant soybeans and then plant corn. Um, this helps fertilize the soil and also breaks up these cycles of pests and diseases. Polycultures. Uh, this is when you use, you plant more than one crop. You plant two or several different crop species sufficiently close enough together to result in complementation or competition. Uh, and so the different plants growing in the same soil, they, they complement each other in the sense that they're all adding different nutrients in creating fertility. Um, and they also compete with each other for sunlight and other available resources, which increases overall yield. Agroforestry systems. Um, so plant trees together with your annual crops or your animals and allow these different components of the ecosystem to complement one another. Uh, crops don't need full sunlight, so they can be planted under trees. They'll still grow just as well. Plus, it breaks up fields so that you don't have the same exact stand of one crop in the same place all the time. Um, it's more diverse, it's naturally more resilient. And animals also, um, eating the grass that's grown from the sun, um, defecating the animal manure, then fertilizing the grass and other plants, which allow them to grow and capture more sunlight, thus creating more biomass and more grass to feed the animals. Um, so integrate these different aspects together. Cover crops, another strategy in agroecology. We just talked about this, the rye cover crop. Instead of using herbicides and uh, other chemicals, use a rye cover crop. Um, not only do you eliminate the need for all these toxic chemicals, but it also has additional benefits. And animal integration, which I sort of touched on already, but um, allow the cows to actually graze on the grass. The sun, sunlight is free, right? It grows the grass, the cows eat the grass, they defecate, their manure fertilizes the grass further, allowing it to grow, to capture more sunlight, to feed more cows and so on. It's sort of closed loop production. Um, everything is, is within the system is recycled. And so actually you're gonna watch an excellent example of alternatives. Uh, to industrial food production. And this example comes from Polyface Farms. You actually already met the guy that runs Polyface Farms. His name's Joel Saladin. He's in uh, Food Inc. that we watched. He's sort of, what well, you'll see in just a sec, but he's the one that uh, has sort of a pastoral farming system. And so it requires people, warm bodies, and sort of working with nature rather than the industrial system. So what I want you to do is pause this lecture and then take a look at the clip and then come back and resume the lecture and we'll talk about it. So hopefully you just watched the clip on polyphase farms. It's a great example of alternative ways we could be farming. One reason that it's not done this way, uh, how Joel Saladin does it, is you can't, the scale of production can't be as large. The profit margins basically can't be as large. So let's just do a brief uh, comparison between industrial uh, agriculture and polyphase farms. First of all, industrial methods for farming, it's a factory model with massive outputs, tons of yield that requires huge chemical and fossil fuel inputs. It's, it's again, it's a factory versus a farm. In contrast, pastoral methods, this is related to letting animals graze on the natural land, the grass, 
use the natural occurring vegetation to feed the animals who will then feed the grass by producing manure, uh, then grows the grass, captures more sunlight, feeds the cows, and so on. It takes virtually no non-human inputs or chemicals or fossil fuels, just humans to, to move the animals, to rotate them. You also don't get any of the byproducts, the pollution, the eutrophication, the toxic runoff, the soil degradation that you do with industrial farming. Industrial ag uses annual species. Uh, seeds you plant and grow for one season and then they die and then you have to repurchase the seed. Perennials, in contrast, regrow every spring. You don't have to buy more seed or replant them. And interestingly, the difference between an annual and a perennial is genetic. And there's a clever plant gene technique that can be used to actually change any annual into a perennial. Um, why, why don't we do this? Why don't people do this? Um, if people had perennial seeds, then they wouldn't have to buy new seeds from Monsanto and other large companies every year. Profit motive. Industrial ag is based off monoculture. Plant one crop year round. Um, it results in high yields, but huge social and, and environmental costs. Depleted soil, uh, chemical inputs, runoff, and also it becomes vulnerable to climate fluctuations or market fluctuations. So if you're growing just one crop and something goes wrong in your field, uh, you're out of luck. That entire species is going to be vulnerable. If you're growing just one crop and the price on the market collapses, you're out of luck. With polyculture, you plant and grow multiple crops. It's more diverse and resilient. And also it makes the farmer more resilient so that if one crop falls through on the market or doesn't do well that season, um, the farm's diversified. They have other crops or commodities to rely on. Industrial ag uses fossil fuel energy, um, lots of non-human energy inputs to keep plants growing on this continually depleted soil. It's polluting, it's wasteful. It it's, doesn't seem to be sustainable in the long run, but time, time will tell. In contrast, polyphase farms and pastoral systems use solar energy, which is re renewable, right? Capture it. Um, it. The main difference being, right, you can't, the scale of production might not be as large, right? You don't have this vast sort of stored energy source that we do with fossil fuel, which is basically stored energy. And industrial agriculture produces for the global market. Um, the scale of production is huge and the system is driven and structured according to profits. Um, thus, whatever is most profitable is what's done. And this is unfortunately also uh, not what is best for the environment or social equality. Um, I mean, remember in uh, Food Inc., ICE, Immigration Enforcement in the U.S., had a deal with the production company Smithfield, where they would come in and arrest undocumented workers, but only 15%, only 15 workers per day, uh, or 15% of the production line, so that they ICE was still deporting people, but not enough people to mess with Smithfield's production line, right? So they can continue to produce our cheap holiday hands and whatnot. Um, so the global market sort of allows for this. It allows for these externalized costs. Um, it's all about profit on the market and doing whatever's cheapest. This is in contrast to producing for the local market, right? Um, you're probably focused less on profit. Um, you aren't using as much energy. It might cost a little more, the stuff you're selling, but it'll be healthier, it'll be more sustainable, it'll usually taste better, be more ripe um, because it's local. Industrial ag specialized, focus on one or two crops for the market. Again, this makes them vulnerable both to ecological and market fluctuations. Uh, pastoral systems are diversified. If one crop fails uh, or the market price drops, there's others to fall back on. Industrial ag uses mechanical energy. It's all tractors and spraying chemicals. Very little human labor is needed. And one of the results is unemployment in farming communities. This is in contrast to pastoral, uses biological energy, human bodies, human energy inputs. This creates jobs. It also 
precludes the pollution and the energy waste that comes with using mechanical energy and mechanical inputs. And lastly, industrial ag uses imported fertility, fossil fuels, um, fertilizer, which is not only wasteful and degrading, um, but not renewable. In contrast to local fertility, um, use the sun and the local biomass to capture that sunlight, to feed the animals, uh, to fertilize the soil, who will then defecate, recontribute to the soil, which can then capture more sunlight and grow more biomass. So in terms of small-scale agroecology, some conclusions. There's some evidence that plants grown this way um, through agroecology methods versus with chemicals and fertilizer are more nourishing than those grown in synthetically fertilized soils, but it's not conclusive evidence. Um, usually the, this type of food tastes better, um, it smells better, it's more nutri it's picked at the peak of freshness and nutrition. A lot of other foods when they're not produced locally and they come from foreign markets like bananas and pineapples from Hawaii or other places, they're picked when they're green, not ripe, transported maybe 3,000 miles to their destination and then artificially ripened with ethylene gas. And fruit naturally releases ethylene gas to ripen. It's a natural process that happens. But when the fruit is ready, to be fully matured. And so when you pick it before it's matured and ship it overseas and artificially ripen it with ethylene gas, um, it looks ripe. It might look like a really delicious apple, but it might actually taste like one, right? Because it hasn't been allowed to mature into peak flavor, peak nutritional quality. It's been artificially ripened. On that note, uh, foods grown in this type of soil usually taste better. Uh, plants grown this way are less prone to disease and index. Again, uh, agroecology methods reflect more diversified ecosystems in contrast to monocropping. And this type of agriculture can be quite productive. Um, it can be equally productive or even more productive than industrial farming in terms of how, many, how much energy you're putting in and how much food you're getting out. Um, again, one, one of the reasons industrial agriculture is actually really inefficient once you account for all the non-human energy inputs, the fossil fuels and the chemicals. So the big question, why isn't there more research into agroecology from private companies, um, seeing as this could be a major solution to any food problems we might have? And the answer essentially is because you can't patent these techniques, right? You can't patent them as your own intellectual property and therefore make profits off them. And so there's not a huge incentive for businesses to do more research into them. Can small scale agroecology feed the world? Yeah, we could definitely be doing things different. A lot of places around the world already do things much differently than we do. Um, a couple of things Poland says though, uh, or results in general, is we would need to eat less meat, right? Remember, meat is really consumptive. 90% of the energy that goes into growing the animal is lost just through trophic levels. Um, we'd need to eat locally grown foods at least a lot more often um, so that all that food is not being transported via fossil fuels thousands and thousands of miles. We would need to give more control to the farmers over the farm bill and the policies that structure the way they run their businesses and sell their farm products. Um, it's not really controlled by the farmers right now. The farm bill is controlled by elites, political and economic elites. Um, we would also need to change government policy, change the farm bill, change the incentives, create policies that promote agroecology that incentivize and subsidize these types of methods rather than industrial ag growing a few cheap commodities for enormous profits for a handful of people. Change the policy. This would result in healthier people and healthier farmlands. Um, how does this happen? Right? One, start at home. Um, eat local, support local businesses, go to the farmer's market. Plant a garden, plant some plants in your yard, right? Make the soil healthier in your own little area. Um, a couple of my own tips, I've taken up gardening recently. Coffee grounds, coffee grounds, if you're a coffee drinker, 
excellent source of nitrogen, which is basically what fertilizer is. Take your coffee grounds, sprinkle them on your plants. If you don't have plants, put them on your fucking neighbor's plants. I don't care. Put them on your landlord's plants. Who cares? You're creating fertility. You're healing the land. Um, coffee grounds is a great one. Nitrogen is important. Carbon is also important in plant growth. Ashes. Any type of burnt plant material, burnt into ash, you can incorporate that ash into the soil. This is what they do with slash and burn agriculture. Um, and it levels out the pH, makes the soil less acidic, adds carbon and other valuable material back into the soil for plant growth. Um, all you pot smokers out there, that's what you can do with your ashes. Put them in the soil. Another suggestion, compost. Um, compost. Okay, I think actually that's the end of my suggestions. Anyways, there's stuff you can do as an individual, um, but even more importantly, individual actions matter, but even more importantly, we have to change the larger structural barriers, the way the system is set up. We need to get involved, vote, and change policy. The first priority needs to be changing U.S. Farm Bill policies so that they support farmers, support healthy food, support people, support the environment, rather than just supporting a handful of wealthy individuals. One last reading you had from Michael Pollan was this short one page article from Time Magazine, um, Six Rules for Eating Wisely. And so what Pollan says is eat food, not food products, right? If you can't sort of pull it out of the ground, um, think about what's actually in it. Don't eat anything your grandma wouldn't recognize as food, like xanthan gum, for example, or all those other ingredients that you can't pronounce on the back of the label. Um, if you're going to eat butter, eat butter, not margarine. Avoid high fructose corn syrup. Unfortunately, this doesn't just mean cakes and cookies, but also soups and salads and ketchup and a whole bunch of other food products that we consume. The average American consumes 40 pounds of high fructose corn syrup a year. That's in addition to all the sugars that we already ate pre-1975, pre the invention of high fructose corn syrup. Avoid processed foods. Eat real food, not food products or creations. Second, Poland says spend more and eat less. We spend less than any other nation on food, less than 10% of our income as Americans, but also as a nation, we spend more on health care than any other nation. Coincidence? Cheap food's making us sick. Um, if we have healthier food, it might cost a little more because of the cost of production of that food. It's not being subsidized, but we'll end up with healthier people that feel better and need to eat less because what they're eating is actually nutritious, more nutritious. Ignore nutritional science or health claims on packages. Um, food pyramids, all that bullshit put out by the FDA, FDA, be wary about that. Um, is that really designed with your health in mind or are other things coming into play? Especially given most of these marketing tricks are designed to catch your eye and they don't really say anything about the product. For example, a water bottle that says gluten free or GMO free. We, of course, it already doesn't have gluten in it. It's a bottle of water. So a lot of those health claims on packages, it doesn't actually even tell you anything about the product. Um, it's, it's probably not, might not even be relevant to the product, but it catches your eye, makes you feel good about your decision, makes you feel healthy about it, has that added value Poland's talking about. Shop at the farmer's market. You'll end up eating foods that are in season, which means they'll be at peak flavor and nutritional quality. You'll also be supporting local farmers, preventing all that waste on imported food transportation, uh, among other things. And lastly, Poland sort of says how you eat is as important as what you eat. Um, so you shouldn't eat alone. You, I don't know. I eat alone. I, I think his point is, you know, think about it. Enjoy it. Savor it. It's not just sort of a chore or something to rush through or fill your time with. Um, eat your food with others if you can. You can still watch TV. Last thing we'll talk about in relation to industrial food production is something called food deserts. So what are food deserts? They are places with liquor stores, with fast food restaurants like this walkthrough jack-in-the-box on the slide, uh, and no real actual food for miles. Um, so even if people want to eat healthier, they may not have access where where they live to healthy food. 
Uh, there's even even Vons here in San Diego has different tiers. And depending on the affluence of the neighborhood, they provide more or less organics, more or less healthy food. The more affluent neighborhoods have higher tiered Vons with more organics, more produce. Uh, less wealthy neighborhoods, opposite. It's a thing. Look it up. And so we're going to watch a TED Talk. It's the last thing we'll do by Ron Finley, uh, a gorilla gardener in South Central LA is the name of a TED Talk. And so go ahead and, and watch this TED Talk. It's about 12 minutes long and it's about food deserts. It's a great way to sort of wrap up industrial food production. Uh, before I let you go, because this will be the end of the lecture and then you'll go watch the TED Talk to finish up the subject, uh, let me just make a couple of quick announcements. This will be the end of our section on industrial food production and sustainability in industrial society. Uh, the next section of the course is sustainability across cultures and through time. So we'll be looking at various case studies of different cultures from different time periods in different places. And what can we learn from these societies? How have they interacted with their environment? How have they managed their resource base? Has it been sustainable or not? Um, environmental degradation is not an inevitable result of human organization, um, of, of people. Rather, it's culturally specific. It's not set in stone, right? People created the system we're in today. People can change it. What can we learn from other cultures to better inform our own directions about sustainability? And so we'll be starting with this section with a case study on pre-industrial complex farming societies, namely the Maya. And you're gonna be reading two articles about the Maya, um, which take sort of two different sides Two different sides to the story of what happened to the Maya. Um, did they overshoot their environment and collapse or did something else happen? And so with that, uh, watch the TED Talk and have a good rest of your day.